Welcome to Textonation. We're speaking with Carter M. Art, the Director of Astrovisualization, big word there, <laughs> at the American Museum of Natural History, where we've just watched a, a premiere, more or less, of, of Worlds Beyond Earth mm -hmm. at the Hayden Planetarium. Give us the overview, first of all. What should people know about Worlds Beyond Earth? Well, um, you know, our, our last show is about cosmology, and uh, it's called Dark Universe. And um, But in this show, what we were wanting to capitalize on is in the last 50, 60 years of exploration of our space program, we've been able to go to these worlds. And so we understand a lot of our solar system with, uh, you know, from, from our first forays to the moon, to the inner uh, planets of the solar system, and then on out with Voyager, and then the spate of missions uh, to um, the uh, gas giants and, and so forth, and, you know, the Galileo mission to Jupiter, the Cassini mission, the amazing Cassini mission to Saturn, which was up there for 13 years. And indeed, on out to Pluto, and, and even beyond to the, the Kuiper belt, um, Ultima Thule, the uh, a um, uh, little icy world that's even beyond Pluto, that uh, we have really, in one lifetime, essentially, um, have spanned, essentially, the ability to travel across the solar system. And so we know a lot about that, and it tells a lot about ourselves. It tells us, gives us um, things to compare our planet to in a better understanding of Earth. And so um, it, it ends up being sort of the message of this show. Um, that we understand Earth better by going beyond to these by, other places. By having gone to all of these, all of these other places. Right. And everything that uh, the audience sees here mm -hmm. is really based on real stuff, real data, oh, very images much so. in some instances. Very much so. In fact, um, one of the things I, I didn't quite elaborate upstairs about uh, but uh, in the Q&A, but uh, that, that the... Um, the positions of everything are accurate to NASA's public, uh, published trajectory files. Um, the imagery that comes back, which is in NASA's planetary data system, um, we combine that insofar as we, we project images. It's uh, seen in several shots of, of the show that we're showing you where the spacecraft is and um, showing exactly where it was looking and, and coordinating all that in time. Uh, NASA needs to do this in order to study missions and then fly them and get the results. And we benefit from that from a data visualization standpoint in being able to sort of um, very accurately reconstruct exactly what these missions saw um, and when they were at these various places. And um, so um, our rendering uh, is essentially through data visualization. Um, that enables us to really show you truly what was there. <laughs> you have been here from the beginning, really, with these shows, right? Yes. So. Um, when I came in 1998, the Hayden Planetarium had just been torn down and was being rebuilt. And the idea um, uh, that uh, of, of recreating the planetarium was really sort of what would the planetarium of the 21st century be? The planetarium was in, invented in the uh, 1920s by the German company Zeiss, the projection planetarium. Um, and in 1935, the, uh, in October of 35, the Hayden Planetarium opened here. It was a sensation um, to New York. It wasn't the first in the United States. The Adler Planetarium in Chicago was. But um, by the turn of the millennium, we were facing new technologies that could really enable us further, which was um, to go from essentially stars on the ceiling into space, um, aided by, you know, essentially computers hooked up to um, high-resolution video display. And what, and we what you're showing here now, mm -hmm. we've taken this to a new level. It is. Um, like anything, if you work the problem long enough, uh, hopefully you get better at it. And um, so uh, that, uh, on the, the process of the data visualization has gotten, has gotten better. Our production techniques have, have evolved. Um, but also the data that's been coming in from all these missions. Um, this has been uh, a sort of steady age of exploration uh, since uh, Sputnik, really. Um, that started, of course, the, uh, within the Cold War scenario, just the competition and the moon race and all that. Um, but uh, what, we, what we learned um, in going to the moon um, and how to do things uh, was extrapolated to our broader space program of going out to 
these other planets and, and learning, in many cases, surprises of what we found out there. And on the technical end, the equipment here, the project, the new, brand new projection system, I think that you're using. Tell us about that. So this is um, uh, this is an amazing laser uh, high dynamic range system uh, from the Chris, from Christie Digital, Christie um, Projection Company, and uh, we've worked with them on this. This is something that they developed for cinema. Um, but was extrapolated uh, into our dome needs, which is where we have to mosaic uh, six projectors together, and um, so into a, like a seamless blend. This high dynamic range capability actually allows us to do something that earlier systems um, uh, just couldn't quite do so do perfectly, and that is sort of blend these images together. Um, it's, it's hard to do that, um, but when you have this um, ability in the high dynamic range, it, what that re means is that you have like a true black level. And that true black level allows us to blend these projectors sort of seamlessly into one image, but it also gives us um, the amazing color gamut, um, the wide color gamut uh, that was unachievable before, so we sort of have a full palette of color to work with with also um, the, uh, basically the high ends, the brightness of the, pro of the projection is fantastic. Um, and so that level of definition to the new projection really aids in the sense of when a camera motion um, through you know, space, moving around objects, rend renders that sort of uh, perspective shift and parallax as you move around. So you get you get depth cueing from that. So you sort of get 3D without needing the glasses, essentially. Um, and uh, and we try uh, to our best in, in, a pro in production to make sure that the motions are not too radical, <laughs> to make anybody ill, um, but also not too slow as to uh, be boring. So we want to be exciting. But, uh, so that, that's the aspect of keeping the attention. But within that, we can really show the science. And so the evolution of the planetarium from essentially a demonstration of what we see in the night sky into a, a visual system to display uh, science um, allows us to then bring in latest science. If we make a discovery, we can put it into the system um, almost immediately and update it. And so that's, that's what's been truly extraordinary in the last 20 years of perspective with uh, regards to the content is that uh, we've had missions to various places. Um, uh, the Rosetta mission to Comet 67P and Cherry Mob Gerasimenko uh, Comet. And um, also the rovers on Mars, um, the orbiters around Mars, a tremendous uh, activity there. Um, also the messenger mission to Mercury. Um, but as we also feature here, the Cassini mission to Saturn uh, it was truly an extraordinary mission. Um, and uh, to a beautiful setting um, with a, a great diversity of moons. And um, also, uh, we have another scene in the show um, showing the moon Io at, at Jupiter. Um, quite a revelation, actually, um, that when we went to the moon, you know, it's, it's sort of dead and inert. It's, uh, it's activity over. It's, it still gets occasionally hit by an asteroid. Um, but um, when we flew out to Jupiter, we, we didn't anticipate um, seeing activity on the moons, and then we found out that Io is the most vo volcanic uh, place in the entire solar system. We now sort of understand that uh, through tidal in interaction with the other moons and Jupiter itself. Um, but based on what we had learned from the moon, we were surprised in what we found, um, you know, in, in the case of uh, the outer solar system being as active as it is. Uh, the geysers of Enceladus, we didn't quite have room in the show to show that, uh, but even the activity on, on Pluto, where we have a, a liquid nitrogen sea with these blocks of uh, icebergs of, of, of ice, because the world is made of ice. Ice is like granite, it's so cold out there. So it's, um, we can show all that stuff. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's a great time, actually, uh, for this field as we've moved into projection capability that uh, is, is truly extraordinary. And of course you employ some great talents here on the music end and the, the narration, yes, yes. Lupita Nyong'o. And the, and it's 
ultimately, a, a, it's a big team effort. Uh, we're quite honored to have Lupita as our narrator, and, and uh, she was great. And, and I, I, I love her voice in this. It's, just, it's very calming and soothing. Um, but um, also, um, our team um, that, that does basically t turns data visualization into production, um, the script writing process, uh, having a script writer like Natalie Starkey was uh, really wonderful. She was wonderful to work with. She's a scientist. She knows the field. Um, and also, this is the first time we're doing a show um, curated by a, an Earth scientist and, and uh, also he's our curator of meteorites, uh, Dr. Denton Abel. Um, and, um, what, but what he brings to this is a knowledge of these tangible places. Um, astrophysics, uh, astronomy is, is, has been the study of these places beyond, usually where we just have light as our artifact. But in the case of going to the moon, we have rocks. Uh, um, hopefully in the not too distant future, we'll have samples brought back from Mars by spacecraft. Um, the Mars 2020 mission is going there to essentially collect rocks with the notion of those being selected by that mission um, to be brought back by a future mission. Um, and then also um, we're sampling asteroids. You know, the, the, uh, um, the, uh, the mission out to uh, comet uh, or out to asteroid Bennu, which is um, uh, the uh, um, <laughs> talking so much. I, uh, <laughs> I, I, uh, I was going to. I was going to ask going you here with with all that is going on. Cyrus Rex mission. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> with with all that is going on mm -hmm. today and all that's coming soon. Yes. Yeah. Like say coming soon. Do you worry about things becoming outdated when you put a production like this together? Um, it's no. got to be in the back of your mind. Yes, yes, it is. But um, the the course of this technology is is what's exciting, certainly to be in the flow of. Um, and um, but uh, any one of these these missions, um, you know, and any one of these shows are benchmarks of, of what we do here at at, at the museum. Um, and um, but. Even old data, even old moon rocks are, are, are worth going back and looking at. So the, the science data is, is, is something that uh, just keeps accruing and uh, is worth going back to look at. Um, and in a similar way, I think even these productions are useful to go back and look at and see where we are at because it gives us that milestone by which to compare those improvements. How did this happen for you? How did you wind up doing this? Um, I was inspired as a child um, by the museum. Uh, we were family members. Uh, age 10, I started taking classes here. Um, and uh, so that made me really want to go into um, science. I didn't end up being a scientist. I come from a family of artists, so I ended up in, in data visualization, which uh, eventually brought me uh, back here professionally as uh, so I've been here for the past 20 years. Again, it's Worlds Beyond Earth at the American Museum of Natural History. Carter Emmert, thank you for taking thank the time with us. Okay, thank you. Now this. How many companies out there have continued to innovate when it comes to building a better radio? I'm Fred Fishkin, host of Textonation, and I'm here to tell you about the new CC SkyWave SSB radio from the wonderful people at Sea Crane. Bob and his crew really love radio, and it shows in this new compact model that is packed with features. Beyond great AM and FM reception and sound, you can tune into shortwave signals from around the world, listen to ham radio operators, aviation, and more. It's the radio you'll turn to every day, and in emergencies. It will run for nearly three days on just two AA batteries. Pair the sleep timer with the new Soft Speaker 3, and you've got the perfect radio for your nightstand. Of course, it can wake you up too. Click on Seacrane at Textonation.com and put in the code Textonation for a free flashlight with your order. They love radio, and you'll love Seacrane.